And for those that would really like more of a formal presentation of these slides, um, I'll go ahead and go through pneumatic power with you. Uh, these are the things that this presentation is going to hit. Um, we'll focus on what is pneumatic power. We'll focus on how it's different than hydraulics, um, the properties of it. We'll hit Pascal's law again with a specific question towards pneumatics. And then we'll hit these three gas laws. All right, so as we get started, the biggest thing you need to remember is that pneumatics is an air or a gas. Hydraulics is a liquid, but that's the next presentation. Um, gas also acts more like a spring when it's compressed than hydraulics do. Some of the differences, um, pneumatics use a compressed gas or air. It possesses a quicker or jumpier type motion than the hydraulics do. It's not as precise. It requires oil in the system. Um, every once in a while we have to put oil in there to, treat the, to keep the rubber O-rings that create the seal from drying and rotting out. It's generally cleaner than hydraulics. Often operates at a pressure around 100 pounds per square inch and it generally produces less power. So you won't see it for like forklifts and construction equipment and all that kind of stuff where uh, we're going to be using hydraulics. Okay, so what you can see here is called a bellow. Um, bellows were used a long time ago to stoke or um, make coals hotter so they could direct air into them instead of just blowing on them constantly to make the coals hotter. They would use these bellows. So if you really take a look at them, the idea is when he pulls his hands apart, it pulls that little door um, called the valve open that pulls air inside it. And then as he closes his hands, it pushes that little door closed, it compresses the air, and it shoves it all out that nozzle. Um, so it not only focuses the air, but it compresses it, makes it faster, and gives it a lot more pressure. Gases are really affected by three different variables, and they are temperature, pressure, and volume. Gases have no definite volume, um, so they can fit in any type of shape. Gases are highly compressible, and gases are lighter than liquids. The problem is we're typically reading things like gauge pressure. So the, vol the pressure that we're usually given um, is just the number that's off of the dial that's sitting on the tank or something like that that reads the pressure that's inside the tank. Absolute pressure deals with atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure. So the number that we're typically getting is not the number we're going to want in our formulas. So we need to know what atmospheric pressures were so that we can add gauge pressure and atmospheric pressure to equal absolute pressure. For us, we're going to be using PSI, or pounds per square inch. Um, that's just because we're going to be using standard system. If we were measuring this in metric, we'd be using newtons per square meter. So standard atmospheric pressure for us is 14.7 pounds per square inch. So that's the value we're going to be adding to whatever we read directly off of the device itself to be able to get absolute pressure. So, a quick example. If the gauge reads 120 pounds per square inch, what would the absolute pressure be? So you take your calculator, you add 120.0 PSI plus 14.7 PSI, and we should get 134.7 pounds per square inch. Okay, another quick problem. What about 100? So if we just had a typical 100 pounds per square inch read on the dial or on the gauge, what would we get as our absolute pressure? That's correct. 100 PSI plus 14.7 PSI would give us 114.7 PSI for absolute pressure. That's the value we're going to need for everything except for Pascal's. Absolute temperature. Strangely enough, Zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't actually represent true zero. Absolute zero is negative 146 degrees Fahrenheit. For us, we're going to be using absolute temperature and measure it in Rankins. Again, because we're using standard measurements. If we're going to do things in metric measurements, we would be using Kelvin. So, Rankins for us is our temperature in Fahrenheit plus 460 degrees to raise our number up. 460 degrees from wherever it currently is. So an example, if the temperature of an air system is 65 degrees Fahrenheit, what would the absolute temperature be? Well, to do Rankin, we would take 65 degrees Fahrenheit, add 460 degrees to it, and we should get 525 degrees Rankin. All right, let's do another quick problem. What if the temperature was 70 degrees Fahrenheit? 
what would the absolute temperature be? That's correct. The absolute temperature would be 70 plus 460 to give us 530 degrees Rankin. Make sure you remember both absolute pressure and absolute temperature as we do most of our perfect gas laws. Okay, so let's focus on the one that we already know. Pascals, pressure equals force over area. So those are the ones that we did in the last PowerPoint, but let's put that in a specific example for pneumatics. So for this Pascal's Law example, we have a pneumatic cylinder. There's only two things that we really want to focus on. The force that gets created, or the force that's being put in, and the diameter of that red plunger, that red disc that's inside. Okay, so here's the question. How much pressure can be produced with a 3-inch diameter cylinder and a 60-pound force? How much pressure can be produced with a 3-inch diameter cylinder and 60 pounds of force? All right, well, let's go ahead and label out our knowns. We know that the diameter is 3 inches. We know that our force is 60 pounds. What we don't know is the area and the pressure. So the pressure is what we want to know in the end, how much pressure can be produced. To be able to find pressure, we're going to need areas so that we can use Pascal's formula. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and take our diameter and turn that into radius. So we're going to use area equals pi r squared. So to solve that, we need our area equals 3.14 times 1.50, that's 3 divided in half, squared. So 3.14 times 1.5 times 1.5. And that should give us an answer rounded of an area 7.07. .07. I'm not going to use this rounded value when we actually do the formula itself or put that into our Pascal's formula, but that's what's there. Okay, so now we're going to take Pascal's formula, force over area. So we know we have a force of 60 pounds. We have an area of 7.07 .07 rounded, and we'll go ahead and take that and divide that out to solve for pressure of 8.49 pounds per square inch. So what is the pressure that can be produced with a 3-inch cylinder at a 60-pound force? We can produce 8.5 pounds per square inch. Okay, so now we focus on our perfect gas laws. These are the three laws that are going to need absolute pressure and absolute temperature. So you need to make sure from here on out we're paying attention to the values that are given to us and how they're asking the answers to come out in the end. All right, Boyle's Law. All right, take a look at the little gauge over to the side. So first of all, we can see that the flame that's underneath it, that's what that little orange oval coming out of that black T is supposed to represent is constant. So at a constant temperature, if we increase the pressure, which is the little green things that are dropping on top of it, if we increase the pressure, what happens to the volume? That's correct, it decreases. But strange enough, it doesn't decrease proportionally. Um, it has kind of an arc to it. So as the pressure increases, the smaller the volume decreases. Hmm again only at a constant temperature. So here's our formula. Pressure 1 times volume 1 equals pressure 2 times volume 2. So then your question is going to be, well, which one is pressure 1 and which one is pressure 2? It doesn't really matter. Um, the way we're going to figure out this formula is long as we keep pressure 1 and volume 1 together and pressure 2 and volume 2 together, it doesn't matter which one is which as long as you keep them paired up. A cylinder is filled with 40 cubic inches of air at a pressure of 60 psi. The cylinder is then compressed to 10 cubic inches. What is the resulting absolute pressure? So we have to see that we're looking at the volumes. So the volume increase or did the volume decrease? Correct, it decreased. We compressed it down to a size of 10 cubic inches. So now what we need to think about is that little graph that was on the last page. Is the 60 psi going to go up? Are the 60 psi going to go down? Well, let's test that theory. The first thing we need to do is understand that the gauge pressure is what they gave us and not the absolute pressure. Um, if they don't say, then typically we're going to assume that it's gauge pressure because that's the easiest thing to read. 
So we take a look at our knowns and our unknowns. We know that pressure one is 60 pounds per square inch. Volume one is 40 cubic inches. How did I know that that was P1 and V1? It really doesn't matter. As long as I understand that the 40 and the 60 went together, it doesn't matter which one is one and which one is two. So P2 is what I don't know, the resulting absolute pressure. And V2 is the compressed volume of 10 inches cubic. Again, it doesn't matter that two is the compressed one or one is the compressed one, it really doesn't matter. Okay, so first thing we need to do is convert P1 to absolute pressure. So take a look back at your notes and remember what did we have to add or subtract or multiply or divide to the pressure that we had to try to get absolute pressure. That's correct. We need to add 60 to 14.7 to get our absolute pressure. So 60 pounds of gauge pressure to 14.7 atmospheric pressure gives us 74.7 PSI for our P1. We'll then take a look at our original formula from the last slide. P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. So we now know P1 and V1. We don't know P2 yet, but we do know V2. So. 74.7 pounds per square inch times 40 cubic inches equals P2, which I don't know, times 10, uh, 10 cubic inches. So we multiply 74.7 times 40. We get 2,988 inch pounds equals, I still don't know, P2 times 10 cubic inches. We take 10 over to the other side, so 2,988 divided by 10 should give me 298.8 pounds per square inch in absolute pressure. It asked me what was the resulting absolute pressure, but remember, if they ask what the gauge pressure was, don't let them trick you. You have to take 14.7 back off of it to get 284.1 in gauge pressure. So always make sure you're looking at what kind of answer they're, that, or uh, how they want the answer to be um, given. Okay, Charles Law. First of all, what's the constant? If you're taking a look at the little graphic over at the side, the little GIF, pressure, that's right. So pressure is the one thing that's remaining the same. The temperature is the thing that's increasing and decreasing. So what do we notice by looking at that little chart? As the temperature increases, what happens to the volume? The volume increases, that's correct. The nice part is that it is proportional or a straight line. So the volume of a gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases, provided the amount of gas and pressure remain constant. This is Charles' law. V1 over T1 equals V2, V2 over T2. And same thing, it really doesn't matter which one is V1 and T1, as long as you keep them together in pairs, because we're going to cross multiply. Okay, our second perfect gas law, Charles' law. An expandable container is filled with 28 cubic inches of air, and it's sitting in ice water that's 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so you kind of see it in the background there that's supposed to be a cylinder hiding behind that bucket. It's actually supposed to be in it. Okay, so we have an expandable container. It can get bigger and smaller. It's filled with 28 cubic inches of air, and the, the water that it's sitting in is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The container is then going to be removed. Doo -doo 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 and the icy water, it's removed from the icy water and it's heated to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. But well, first of all, I want you to truly think about, is it going to go up? Because it says, what is the resulting volume? Is the volume gonna go up or is the volume gonna go down? Well, let's test that theory. Okay, so let's do our knowns and our unknowns. V1 is 28 cubic inches. V2, I don't know. T1 is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the 32 is the one with the 28. Yes, that's correct. And the T2 is 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That's correct. Um, typically, the Fahrenheit's that we're going to be provided um, are not the numbers that we need. We need the temperature in Rankin, not the temperatures in Fahrenheit. I wish there was a way of knowing that the gauge pressure was something different, as easy it is with the temperature. So if they give us F, we have to have R. Um, I wish it was just that easy with the gauges. Okay, so first thing we need to do is convert our two temperatures, um, just because we didn't know one of the volumes. Every once in a while they may ask us what the temperature is going to be rather than the volume, but anyway. Okay, so convert T to absolute temperature. T1 equals 32, which was the original, plus 460, and 200, which was the original, plus 460. So we end up with 492 and 660 in degrees Rankin. 
Okay, formula. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Solve 28 cubic inches, which was the original volume, over 492 degrees Rankin equals, I don't know, V2 over 660 degrees Rankin. So we should end up with 18,480 cubic inches, the Rankins both cross out, divided by 492. So we took 28, multiplied it by 660 to cross multiply it, and we divided that by the 492 to get a new volume of 38 cubic inches. That's pretty cool. So did it increase or did it decrease? We went from 28 cubic inches to 38 cubic inches because we went from 32 degrees to 200 degrees. Okay, and our last perfect gas law, Gay-Lussac's law. Absolute pressure of a gas increases or decreases as the temperature increases or decreases, provided the amount of gas and the volume remain constant. So what has to remain constant? The amount of gas and the volume remain constant. So we can increase and decrease the temperature and the pressure, but it's the volume that has to remain constant. Okay, so pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. Temperature one and temperature two are going to be an absolute temperature for now, and pressure one and pressure two are going to be an absolute pressure. And remember, the temperature is going to be pretty easy because it's either going to be in Fahrenheit or Rankin's. It's always going to be the pressure that's going to be the tricky one. All right, so here's our problem. A 300 cubic inch sealed air tank is sitting outside. It's morning time, and the temperature inside the tank reads 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember, that's a problem. We need to turn that into Rankin. Anyway, and the pressure gauge reads 120 PSI. Remember, that's a problem. We need the, not the pressure gauge. We need the absolute pressure. By the afternoon, the temperature inside the tank is expected to become closer to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. What will the absolute pressure be at that point? So we're going from morning when it's colder, and it's going to go to afternoon. Really? That's going to happen? Just because the temperature in the tank changes, it's going to change the pressure in the tank? Absolutely, that's the problem. So let's go ahead and do our knowns and our unknowns. Volume is 300 cubic inches. Temperature 1 is 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Pressure 1 is 120 pounds per square inch and temperature two is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Why isn't the volume labeled as V1 or V2? Remember the volume has to remain constant, so it's gonna stay at a constant 300 cubic inches. So that's really extra information that we really didn't need to know for these formulas. Pressure two is what I don't know. So first thing we're going to do is convert P to absolute pressure. P1 equals 120 plus our magic 14.7 atmospheric pressure to get 134.7 pounds per square inch. We're then gonna go ahead and convert both of our temperatures. To get it from Fahrenheit into Rankin's, we're gonna add our magic number of 460 to raise it from the negative 460 up to the number that we need. All right, so Fahrenheit equals 522 degrees Rankin. Fahrenheit equals 550 degrees Rankin. Let's start shoving all that in. P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. All right, so what are we gonna use for P1? P1 is 120. What are we gonna use for T1? 62. Nope, that's not correct. Neither one of those are correct. We need to use the 134.7 over our 522. So don't go through all the work and not remember that you're supposed to use those numbers. So P1 at absolute pressure over T1 at absolute temperature equals P2, I don't know, over T2 at absolute temperature. So we'll substitute and solve. We have 134.7 pounds per square inch over our 522 degrees Rankin equals pressure two over 550 degrees Rankin. We multiply 134.7 times 550 to get 74,085 pounds per square inch Rankin over 522 degrees Rankin. The Rankins will cross out and gives us a final pressure of 140 pounds per square inch. So we went from 120 to 140, be careful. Our final was really 141.9, but that's in absolute pressure, not in gauge pressure. 
if we were asked at that point what the absolute, if we were asked at that point what the gauge pressure would be, we'd have to make sure we took that 141.9 and subtracted the 14.7 from it to get 127.2. So we really went from um, 120 pounds per square inch to 130 pounds per square inch. So we upped it by 10 um, pounds of pressure and we changed from 62 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so let's look at some of the common pneumatic system components. Um, the first thing is we have a receiver tank. So that's gonna be where we're gonna store all of our air. We also have our transmission line, which can be plastic tubing, can also be metal pipes that go up the wall and over to another room or wherever our devices or our equipment is. The biggest deal here is we have a compressor. The compressor is going to pull in air from the room it's going to squeeze it and it's going to push it into the receiver tank. So that receiver tank is going to hold all of our compressed air from the compressor. Usually the compressor is automatic, so it has a gauge on it that says continue running until the receiver tank has reached a certain pressure and then turn off. As we use the air out of the receiver tank, we lose air and the compressor will turn back on to make more. We now have our cylinder, which is going to be whatever's going to push and pull. We have the filter. Um, we use a filter to take any dust or anything out of the line. Um, we'll also get condensation uh, water that's developing up in the line. And I typically don't want to push that in through the rest of the system. So that filter will allow me to get rid of dust and debris and extra water. We also have a regulator that's somewhere on the system. There's actually two in that picture. There's one just on the other side of the filter and then there's one there. The regulator allows me to control a different amount of pressure. So I might have 100 PSI inside my receiver tank, but I may only want 50 PSI to go out to my pieces of equipment. So we'll put a regulator on there that will allow only a specific amount of pressure to come past that. We'll also have drains that will allow us to get rid of any water or liquid or condensation that has developed inside the line. We'll have a directional control valve. Um, the majority of the time it's electronic. So I can send a signal to it to either open or close, which will allow the cylinder to go in or go out. And then we'll have a pressure relief somewhere that if the pressure ever gets too high, that we can either release the pre we can relief the pressure, um, or if we actually want to drain the air out of the system, we've got a place to be able to do that. And that's it. Thanks for watching.